All right, good morning again. You guys ready to get into the scriptures this morning? All right, okay. Hey, so we are starting off this, uh, this series entitled How to Make This the Best Year of Your Life. We'll get into that. Here's the thing I also wanted to uh, just let everybody know. We are starting uh, a fast. We're asking as a staff and leadership, asking you as a church family, if you're interested in joining us on a 21-day fast. And so um, that's starting tomorrow, actually. So if you're planning on being involved in that and being a part of that, then you'll want to uh, go ahead and eat whatever you want to today. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, it doesn't, the fast doesn't just always include fasting food. There's other things that we could fast. Some folks, it's harder for them to fast. And when I mean by fast, it means you're not, you're doing away with something in your life. You're not eating certain foods or you can fast TV. For some folks, that's harder than fasting food. Or fasting Facebook. For some folks, that's harder than anything, right? And so, but what we do is we take that time, we dedicate that time to the Lord in prayer and just ask God to speak to us individually and as a church. So that's starting, that's starting on Monday. And actually, uh, this past Wednesday, we have services the first Wednesday of the month. And this past Wednesday, I spent some time going through the scriptures, teaching about the subject of fasting. Why do the scriptures talk about fasting? Why did Jesus say we should fast from time to time? What can we expect to happen in our lives when we do fast, right? And so that, that message should be up on, uh, online on the website by tomorrow, actually, tomorrow afternoon. So I, if you weren't here this past Wednesday and you want to be uh, joined in the fast and you're, or you'd just like to know more about the subject of fasting according to the Bible, then I would encourage you to go to the website and, and uh, watch and or listen to the message, all right? So anyway, we're starting this series how to have the best year of your life. And here's, here's really where this came from is uh, I began to sit down because I know obviously this is the always, 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 this is the, the time of the year for uh, our New Year's resolutions. People make, all right, I'm going to spend less money. I'm going to save more. I'm going to be nicer to my spouse. Maybe not. I'm going to do that. All right, we'll talk about that in a couple of months about marriage. But, but I'm going to do, I'm going to do the dishes, I'm going to clean up, I'm going to help more around the house, all of those things, you know, or I'm going to lose weight, right? I'm, I'm going to get in better shape. I'm going to start exercising. How have you made that resolution? I know that happens now because I'm a part of a gym and I'm there year round and I see the ebb and flow of the attendance and I see there's more folks in the classes, right? Uh, uh, you know, at the first of the year, it's like, we're, everybody's here. And then you know what happens, right? And I've been that guy where I'm going to get into shape. I show up to the gym. I have no idea what's going on. I've never seen these machines in my life, you know, kind of wandering around trying to look like I know what I'm doing. And then by March or April, I'm not there anymore. So we make these resolutions. Our, our intentions are good. We, a lot of times we don't follow through. Right, everybody? And so what I, what I wanted to do, though, for uh, our time in these next four weekends is talking about how can we make this year the best year of our lives. Now, here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that we're, that, that we're going to somehow find a way to avoid problems, setbacks, disappointments, challenges, or trouble. That is unrealistic. That is not going to happen. As a matter of fact, in the scriptures, Jesus said this, in this world you will have trouble. Now, that's not one that really warms our heart. That's not something that we, verse that we necessarily read the first thing in the morning and go, wow, I hope I get me some good trouble today. But it is a problem. I mean, it is a, it's a reality, right, everybody? In, Jesus said it. In this world, you'll have trouble because this is a fallen world. None of us are perfect. The world is imperfect. Jesus hasn't come and redeemed all things. He hasn't redeemed the earth. The devil is still alive doing his thing. Jesus hasn't confined him to hell forever yet. He's going to, but he hasn't done it yet. So Jesus said, because of all of those reasons, in this world, you're going to have some hardship. You're going to have some trouble. But he goes on to say, take heart, I've overcome the world. So Jesus is greater than the things that trouble us. That's why I often quote the verse, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, the one that causes the trouble, the devil. Greater is Jesus on the inside of us than all the doubts and fears that have ruled us in the past. Greater is Jesus on the inside of us than all the challenges and setbacks. We may face difficulty, but we overcome because the overcomer lives on the inside of us. Can I get a witness? I'm going to go T.D. Jakes pretty soon. Anyway, I love that guy. So, uh, but 
that's the promise that we have. So when we talk about making this the greatest, the, the best year of our lives, we're not talking about that means we're not going to have any hardship, we're not going to have any challenges. It does mean that, uh, that we're going to see the power of God expressed in our lives. We still can, ha- no matter what uh, hardships we face, this can still be the best year of our lives. So what I did is I sat down and I began to think about some of the principles from the Scriptures some of the truths from the Bible that Bonnie and I implemented in our lives that helped us have great years, that really helped us experience a turnaround, changes in our lives. Now, our lives aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. You know that, of course, if you've been here for very long at all. And, and uh, Bonnie's not perfect, though she seems like she is, but she's really not. She's almost perfect, but believe me, there's parts of her that aren't perfect. Where none of us are perfect, right? Just like Molly's testimony, she thought everybody had this perfect family. When I heard her say that, I, I, I laughed. I thought she hadn't been around the kids and the, all of us. No perfect people allowed, right? So there's a bunch of imperfect people. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is, so Bonnie and I aren't perfect, but what there were some things that God, by His grace, helped us to implement and showed us to put into practice in our lives that really translated into uh, Bonnie and I seeing some real turnarounds in our family, our marriage, our home. And so I wanted to share those things with you these next four weekends. These are things that we personally had to adjust. These are like what I'm going to talk with you about this morning is an area where uh, it wasn't operating in my life at one point. And then I had to make an adjustment and I had to submit myself to this particular principle or truth that we're going to talk about. And when I did, I began to see some things change for the better in my life, in our marriage, in our home and in our family. And so I just want to share some of these things these next four weekends. And I hope, I hope that you'll make it a priority to just be here each of these weekends because I want to see all of us experience more of God, more of his power, more of his grace more of his life, listen folks, more of his joy in our lives this year than we've ever experienced in previous years. Not that the other years are bad, but I'm telling you, this can be the best year of our life with God. We'll have hardship, but I want us to have more joy this year than we've ever had, more confidence in God this year than we've ever had, more faith in his faithfulness than we've ever had. I want husbands and wives loving each other more than they've ever loved each other. I want our children obeying their parents like they've never have in their whole lives. I thought I'd get something off of that one, but you know, I just want all of us, and I'm including myself in that. I want to be the, be- I want to be the best pastor I've ever been this year. I want to be the best husband for Bonnie. I want to be the best friend. I want to be the, I want to be the best papa, grandpa. I want to be the, I just want to be the best I can be in God this year, right? So we're going to talk about some things that I know will help us move towards that in a really remarkable way. And here's the first principle, and that is this. And it's so simple, but making God first, making God first. So here's the first scripture we need to look at, and this is our foundational scripture this morning. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. Now, we've talked about this verse before. What are all the things being added to us that Jesus is referring to? Well, right before that verse, Jesus is describing And he's letting his hearers, those that that are listening to him preach, he's letting the crowd know how he's able to identify and understand the fears and the anxieties and the worries that all of us deal with. So right before this verse, he's talking about how easy it is for us to worry about, and and the the verse says, the passage says, what we're going to wear or what we're going to eat, okay? And basically what he's saying is, now there's some folks, they're that they're having that much challenge, they don't know what they're going to eat from day to day or week to week. But he's also talking about just the normal fears and anxieties we have about the things that we need, the things we need, our kids need, the things that we need just to live life. It's the practical stuff that's knocking on our door every day, that faces us every day. Uh, I mean, just these things that have to be met, these provisions that we need, whether it's the provision of finances or strength or grace or patience, Jesus is saying this. First of all, I get it. I understand. I know what it's, I understand the fear that you have, 
Then he talks about the fact, as we sang earlier, we're sons and daughters of God. You're not orphans. We've talked about this before. You have a father. He loves you. He's going to take care of you. He's, he wants to meet you at every point of need that you have. And then Jesus says, here's how that happens. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. Do that first. Now, here's the thing. Here's, now, I want us to focus on one aspect of this verse. Jesus didn't say, seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. He said to you and I, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. And the truth is, and I've been in this category, I've been this person more than once in my life, where God is important to me, I'm seeking the kingdom. Jesus is a priority. He's just not the first priority. I'm seeking the things of God and the things of the kingdom of God and righteousness, but I'm not seeking it first. And I really, I'm, I'm, I want us to see a principle here, folks, that is life-changing. I'm telling you. And that is uh, uh, point number one, the principle of firsts that we see throughout the scriptures. The principle of first. So in other words, there's something according to Jesus, supernatural, that happens in our lives when God isn't just a priority, he's the first priority. That we're not just going after the things of the kingdom, but we've placed all of those things first in our lives. We're seeking the kingdom of God. Everybody say the word with me. First. We're doing it first. It's the principle of first. And as I said a moment ago, we see it all throughout the scriptures. Here's one example here at the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. Now, this is, uh, this is something that uh, is a, uh, something is highlighted for us, the principle first that we see here. And it has to do with Cain and Abel. So many of you, are, if you're familiar with the story, Cain and Abel uh, are the sons of Adam and Eve, the very first human beings on the planet. And so Cain and Abel, there was this rift that took place in their relationship. It was so violent, so strong, that eventually Cain killed Abel. Cain became extremely jealous over Abel and eventually killed him, all right? And so what was leading up, the beginning of leading up to Cain's jealousy is found in this passage right here. But this passage also reveals to us this truth, this principle that we're calling this morning the principle of firsts. So let's take a look at the passage, starting in verse 3, Genesis chapter 4. It says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Now, if you, be, if you continue on with that passage... God, and I'm paraphrasing now, God speaks to Cain and says, Cain, why are you so upset? You know the right thing to do. And God goes on to say, it, 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 you know, you need to be committed to doing the right thing because sin is crouching at the door, ready to pounce on you. Now, again, I'm paraphrasing it, but if you have the scriptures in front of you, you can read it, and that's exactly what took place. So obviously, that implies to us there was some understanding that both Cain and Abel had regarding their relationship with God. Now, for the longest time, for the longest time when I read this passage, any time that I would read it, it bothered me. I really, I could not understand. Here's Cain bringing an offering to the Lord. Here's Abel bringing an offering to the Lord for worship, their expression of worship. And God is seemingly favoring Abel over Cain. He rejects Cain's offering. He accepts Abel's offering. And it seemed unfair to me, just to me. It seemed unfair. And it kind of bothered me a little bit. I'm like, man... It seems like God has favorites here. And it seems like he's favoring Abel over Cain. And I don't understand why they're both coming to, to God. They're both worshiping him with their, their resources. What's the problem here? I, I, for the longest time, I, I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. And quite honestly, I wanted to know why. Because I wanted anything I did for God to be accepted. I didn't want to be a Cain. I didn't want to be that guy where I bring something to the Lord and he's not really jazzed about it, right? We all feel that way, right, everybody? And so I kind of wanted to untangle this and figure this out. And then it dawned on me. It realized, then I realized I saw something that I hadn't seen 
after reading this passage numerous times, I finally saw something I hadn't seen before. Go back to the very, let's go back to the first part of this passage. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering. Now look at Abel. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock. In other words, Abel was bringing to the Lord his very firstborn. Abel didn't know if the other, other uh, livestock that would, that would be birthed were, were going to be lame, were going to be healthy or not. He didn't wait to see how much livestock he had. He didn't wait to see how healthy his livestock was and then make an offering to the Lord. Abel did it first before there was any guarantee of what, his, what, the, what the next livestock, what the next births were going to be. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? And see, Abel brought his first. Cain brought his offering in the course of time. God was an afterthought for Cain. He waited to see how well his crops were. He waited to see how healthy his crops were. He waited to see what they were going to look like in the end. And then he decided what he was going to bring to the Lord. How many of you realize that God declares and commands and really demands that in all things He's first in our lives? Would you agree with that? And so it's finally dawned on me. The problem going on here, and Cain knew it. The way God speaks to Cain after this, after this passage and lets us know that Cain knew good and well what he was supposed to do. And he was, he was, Cain was attempting to worship God and live for God, and seek God on his own terms, and Abel had surrendered himself to trust God and believe God and give God that place of first in his life. Again, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. So I said before, a lot of people are seeking the kingdom, and God's important to them, and God's a priority to them. He's just not the first priority. Jesus said if he's first, then you don't have to worry about anything else. You put God first and everything else comes in line. Cain was trying to do it on his own terms and God was an afterthought, right? So again, I'm saying this is a principle all throughout the scripture. So if we go, actually if we go to Exodus chapter 13, it, God really unpacks this and gives us a little bit more detail and it's still the same principle. It's called the principle of first. But in Exodus chapter 13, Here's what it says. God spoke to Moses saying, consecrate every firstborn to me. Now there's a reason why God is saying this. Everything that God says, there's a reason for it. There's a purpose for it. It's not arbitrary. God spoke to Moses saying, consecrate every firstborn to me. The first one to come from the womb, human beings, mankind, among the Israelites, whether person or animal is mine. Watch this. Think about, I mean, this is intense, right? I mean, God's like, how many realize when God speaks to us, and when God speaks to us from his word, well, actually, anytime God speaks to us, how many realize, we all, I think we do, that it's not a suggestion? Yes or no? I mean, it's not, a, when God speaks to us, it's not a suggestion. If you guys, if you feel like it, do this. You never see that in the Bible where God says, if you feel like it, do this. The closest we have is when he says, give that 10%, that first 10%, give that to me. And, and, and even then he doesn't say, if you feel like it, he just double dogs dares you to do it. I dare you to do it. See if I'll not bless you. Watch all these other things be added to you. Does that make sense, everybody? You see what I'm saying? So in this passage, there's a, this is powerful now. There's something going on here. God says, consecrate everything. He says, listen, it's not yours. It's not, it doesn't belong. It's mine. The first of everything is mine. The first of everything is mine. So the firstborn of the child, you consecrate that child to the Lord. The firstborn of your livestock, you take that and you, you sacrifice that to me as an act of worship. If we go further down in the same chapter, okay? Further down the same chapter, starting in verse 11. It says, when God brings you into the land of the Canaanites as he promised you and your fathers, and turns it over to you, you are to set aside the first birth out of every womb to God. Again, he's saying the same thing. Every first birth from your livestock belongs to God. Then he, 
he, he gives a little bit more explanation to it. He says, you can redeem every first birth of a donkey, for example, if you want to by substituting a lamb. If you decide not to redeem it, you must break its neck. Now, this is the, this is the part of the scriptures in the Old Testament that a lot of times we have difficulty with because it seems so contradictory to our understanding of a God of mercy, a God of kindness, a God of love, a God of grace. But I want, I want to submit to you that God is not schizophrenic. He's not a different God in the Old Testament and a different God in the New Testament. Then in the Old Testament, he was in a really bad mood. And then Jesus came and, and sacrificed his life for our sins, and now God's happy and he's in a good mood now, so everything's going to go well for us. It's not two different, God doesn't have two, a split personality here, right? He's not, he, he, he's not a different God. There's a reason why God is saying this. There's something here that we really need to get a hold of. Again, it's that principle of first, but he, this is powerful. So notice again what he's saying here, that, that if, you, if it's a firstborn child, you consecrate that child. God, this child belongs to you. Now all the children belong to him, but there's something significant about the firstborn. And so we, we consecrate the firstborn to you, and then the first of their flock, God said, that's not yours, that's mine. You sacrifice that animal, you spill its blood, and you worship to me. Now, for example, if you have a firstborn of livestock, and if for some reason it's unclean, if it's lame, if it's sickly, if there's something wrong with it in some way, you can redeem it by substituting a lamb, but if you don't redeem it, then you need to break its neck and end its life. Whoa, what in the world? But here's what God is saying. He's saying the first, if the firstborn animal was clean, it needed to be sacrificed to him in worship. If the firstborn animal, and he used a donkey for an example, if the firstborn animal was unclean, then it needed to be redeemed with a clean animal. Now I know we look at that and go, what in the world? Why would God do that? It seems so weird. It, didn't, it doesn't make any sense until we fast forward to the book of John. John chapter 1, verse 29, where Jesus is beginning his ministry. John the Baptist has been preparing the way, preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's talking about a Messiah, a Redeemer that's going to come and redeem all of mankind. Jesus knows what's going on with John. They're related. And they're cousins. And so Jesus goes to where John is baptizing and it says the next day when John saw Jesus coming toward him, he said this. Watch this. This is the first declaration of who Jesus is. comes out of the mouth of John the Baptist. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb. See, all of a sudden we're looking at Exodus and, you know, you know if it's the animal's clean, it, you, you, you sacrifice it to me and worship God says if it's unclean if you want to you can redeem it by taking a clean animal and sacrificing it and that makes that unclean animal suddenly redeemed if you don't do it you need to break its neck it loses its life that all seems weird until we see John look at Jesus and say behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world see listen Jesus was born clean Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus was born without a sin nature. Jesus was God personified, incarnate. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God, lived a perfect, clean, holy, righteous life, right? He was born clean. We were born unclean. We were born with what's called a sin nature. What's a sin nature? It's the very thing on the inside of us that causes us to want to disobey God. What is the sin nature? Those of you that have small children or you're around small children, let me explain it this way. Here's how the sin nature looks. The sin, because every one of us are born unclean, born with the need of a Savior, see that uncleanness, is expressed that that's why you don't have to teach a child to disobey. You have to teach it to obey. Why? Because to disobey and to do what it wants to do, that child wants to do, is in its nature. It's who they are. And how do you realize that you can be a little 
two-year-old or three-year-old and have temper tantrums and stomp your feet and exert your will and every parent of a two-year-old or a three-year-old call it the terrible twos, right? Because that's when that will really starts showing up and that's only because you're asking them to do something they don't want to do, right? And, and we, y'all remember? Some of you are there, right? And you're like, man, that's, that, that's the uncleanness. Every one of us were born with it. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, listen, because you were born the first time, you are unclean. You need to be redeemed. You need a Savior, so you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can I go in my mother's womb again? Jesus says, you're not getting it. You need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be born of God. You need to be born again with the righteousness of God. Does this make sense, everybody? See, Jesus was born clean. We were born unclean. God, that's why God said in Exodus, if, you, if something's born unclean and you want to redeem it, then find an animal that's clean and sacrifice it. See, Jesus was God's first born son. Jesus is the firstborn of God. He did exactly what he told the Israelites to do. In other words, what he was telling them in Exodus was a foreshadowing. It was a foretelling. It was a declaration of this amazing act of redemption that God himself would do by giving us his first and only son to come to this earth and be the perfect lamb of God and to live a perfect life and then take that perfect life and bust it open and pour it out on the cross so that anyone who would believe on him, put their trust in him, would go from being unclean to clean, unrighteous to righteous, ungodly to godly. Does that make sense? Being orphans to now being sons and daughters of God. Man, that, the power of first. See, Jesus, it says in Romans, was the firstborn among many brothers. What that means is, is he was the first one to walk around with the nature and the spirit of God. The rest of us the rest of those would be you and I who place our trust in Him. And God didn't wait to see how, we'd, how we would respond or how well it would go. He didn't wait to see if it would work before He gave His firstborn Son and His only Son to redeem us. See, Abel didn't wait and to see how well his livestock would go before He gave His... See, here's the thing. The only way God can redeem the rest of our lives or show his redemption strong in the rest of our lives is if we'll give the rest of our, give everything first to him. Give him the first that belong to him. Does that make sense, everybody? We've got to give him, see, by giving him this principle of first is what God created. It's only when we give to God the first that he can redeem the rest. Now, can I say that again? It's only when we give God the first first of our lives that he's able to redeem the rest. So in other words, there's a lot of folks that are trying to manage unredeemed finances. They're trying to work through and work with unredeemed time. They're trying to push off these ugly, horrible, unredeemed thoughts of depression or anger or resentment or unforgiveness. What I'm saying, this principle, the first Jesus is saying this, man, seek the kingdom of God first. Give God the first of your time, the first of your finances, the first of your thoughts, the first of your life, the first of your heart, and watch him add everything you need to you. Watch him redeem the rest when we give him the first. Not just a priority, but the first priority. Right, everybody? The principle of first. What I'd like for us to do, if we could, is just bow our heads. And, and I'm going to ask you to close, close your eyes just so we can kind of be in an attitude of prayer so that God can just speak to us. And as I'm doing that, I'm going to ask the prayer teams if they would to come to the front. Now, after we dismiss, if you need prayer for anything at all, these folks are here for you. But I'm going to ask, well, there's a couple of questions I, I feel like that we want to, in closing, ask ourselves today. The first question is this. Maybe at the beginning of this new year, the first part of the year, maybe you're here and either at one time you were serving the Lord and you just allowed life to just derail you. Maybe you've never really made a conscious choice to put Jesus first in your life, to make him your Lord and your Savior. 
to experience that, that, that experience that Jesus talks about where we're born again. We're born this time of the Spirit of God. And how that happens is by saying, Jesus, come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Confessing Him as our Lord. Turning our lives over to Him. Putting our trust not in us, but in Him. So maybe there's some of us here this morning that that's the decision that needs to be made. That's real, really where it all starts anyway, doesn't it? It all starts with us giving God our lives, turning our lives over to Him. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, maybe you're here and that's you. That's the decision that faces you this morning. That before you even figure out your time and every aspect of your life and making God first, you need to make Him your Savior. And if that's your desire, and you know that's what you need to do, and you feel God tugging at your heart, that's the best way I can describe it. You know what I mean by that. That You know God's leading you. You know this is the time. Your desire is to see God change your life. You're done doing it on your own. You're at the end of your rope. You've exhausted all other options. You realize, man, I need Jesus. I can't do this. I'm telling you, he's here for you. If that's your heart cry, if that's your prayer, I'd like for you to let me know that by slipping your hand up just high enough and long enough for me to see that. There's several of us doing that now. Just lift it up. This is not the time to be bashful or self-conscious. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. But man, this is your opportunity, folks. This is your divine appointment today. Father, you see these hands. Now, the second question is this. Lord, Father, there may be some folks here that you've just allowed life to, to shuffle Jesus down further on our list. And life, and the busyness of life has just crowded him out. And we need to put him back to that place of first again. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Say, Pastor, I love the Lord, but man, I know life has just gotten me, uh, it's just shuffled the deck more than it needed to be, and Jesus isn't on top anymore, but he needs to be. So, Father, again, you see these hands, you see these hearts, you see these people. I'd like for us, if we could, just to pray this prayer. That's a prayer that is really a prayer of salvation, inviting Jesus into our hearts, but even for those of us that need to reshuffle the deck again and get Jesus in that proper place of being first, that he has the first of our thoughts, the first of our time, the first of our finances, the first of our hearts, this prayer still is a good prayer. So let's just pray it all together if we could. Just repeat this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross just for me. I look to you not to me. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I invite you into my heart now. I invite you into my life now. I confess you as my Lord. I will follow you. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what the Bible says. If you prayed that and you meant that in your heart, then Jesus sweeps into our lives. If you've never known Him as your Savior, this day, this morning, you're a new person, the Bible says. The Bible says old things have passed away. All things have become new. We are new creatures in Christ. Heaven is our home. Jesus is our Lord. We have a place. We have a place in eternity with Him. There's not enough devils in hell that can, that can rip us out of the hand of Jesus. We belong to Him. And so all of heaven rejoices, the Bible says. So let's take a moment and let's just thank God for new life. Can we do that, everybody? Man, I appreciate your time. Appreciate your patience. I hope this was helpful, man. The principle of first, right, everybody? Just getting God and then watch Him redeem the rest, right? Let's all stand together. Can we thank God for His Word one more time? You guys did so well paying attention. Love you guys. Father, bless your folks right now. Bless your people. May they sense your presence strong in them, carrying them throughout this week. I thank you, Lord God, for all the wonderful opportunities that are out there in front of us. And we commit ourselves to making you first in all things in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. We'll see you next weekend. All right? God bless you. Have a great day.